South Lawn of the White House in Washington, D.C., I'm Billy Taylor, and this is a special edition of Jazz Alive, a White House tribute to the Newport Jazz Festival. In less than 30 minutes, we'll be joined by President Carter and the First Lady, who will kick off the celebration, a performance by some 40 of the giants of jazz, from U.B. Blake to Cecil Taylor, from Joe Jones to Max Roach, from Doc Cheatham to Dizzy Gillespie, this White House Jazz Festival highlights the 25th year of the Newport Jazz Festival. It's a warm, muggy day here in Washington, D.C., but that doesn't seem to be affecting the spirit of the festival here on the south lawn of the White House. In back of us, we can see the Washington Monument and the Ellipse. To our left, the grand view of the White House. And in front of us, there's a jambalaya barbecue going on with music provided by the Young Tuxedo Brass Band. Among the 600 invited guests to the festival are distinguished jazz performers, composers, arrangers, writers, and producers. Some of the guests who we may get a chance to talk with a little later in the program include Gil Evans, Jerry Mulligan, Mercer Ellington, John Lewis, Sam Rivers, George Russell, Joe Newman, and Charlie Mingus. And of course, there's a long list of performers who'll be playing on the stage at the White House today. Beginning next week, Many of these same performers will participate in the Newport Jazz Festival itself at three different locations in New York City. Let's go up on stage now and listen to the Young Tuxedo Brass Band from New Orleans.
Tuxedo Brass Band, live from South Lawn of the White House, and they're marching off the bandstand now to tremendous applause. Everybody loves this group. The Young Tuxedo Brass Band. We're listening to the Young Tuxedo Jazz Band from New Orleans, and they are playing Babyface for the president. birthday tribute to Duke Ellington in the East Room of the White House on April 29th, 1969. And we're on the White House lawn today with Clark Terry as we prepare for the main event of the 1978 White House Jazz Festival. Clark, how does this compare with, you played at the Ellington uh, birthday party, how does this compare? Well, it's just as uh, beautiful and uh, the only thing is that Ellington's party was inside and of course there weren't quite as many people as there are here, but the, 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 the festive feeling is just magnificent here as it was then. And I just feel beautiful about having been invited to both uh, affairs. It's just beautiful. Well, you're an important part, not only of the Ellington band and the various things that have happened in jazz, but you've been a, a goodwill ambassador. You've been to India recently. Yeah, we certainly have, I, and I'm very proud of that. We had a State Department tour in the Middle East, and we went to India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Turkey, and, and, and uh, a couple of other countries, and it was just beautiful. It was amazing to me, Billy, the, the way the people over there accepted uh, our art form, and they loved it, and they are really hungry for it, starving for it. I think we should send a lot more people over there. I'm glad to hear you say that, and I'm, I hope that we can send more people like you around this country because you're doing a lot with young students and traveling all over the country. How do you find the state of jazz? Well, I think that in as much as the just statistics alone proven to us that there are upwards of 25 to 30,000 high school kids alone who are involved in jazz and uh, the perpetuation of our craft, I think that the whole situation is extremely healthy as far as the future is concerned. There are, an enormous amount of uh, extremely talented young people out there and they really love it when uh, old guys like me <laughs> go out there and uh, work with them. Well they are very... Yeah, I love it too. <laughs> they are very fortunate because uh, when someone who is as experienced and who is as sensitive you, as you, as someone who's played on The Tonight Show and have been all around, you have your own band, you've made records, you've worked, I've had the, the privilege of having you in some of the bands I've led. So. And, I, and I never forget it man. As a matter of fact, one of my very, very choice distinctions is when people ask me about the history of the flugelhorn, I can readily tell them that on an album called Tailor Me Jazz was the first note I ever played on that flugelhorn because I took it out of the box, you remember? In, your, in the studio on your date. <laughs> That's right. And it was a memorable occasion for me. But look, you know, this is uh, uh, memorable in another sense because this is so important to have the President of the United States recognize the music that you and all of us have spent so much absolutely, time. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and it's beautiful that he himself is right here attending the affair. And he was down early this afternoon, rehearsal, and shook hands personally with all of us who were here for rehearsal. And now he's back again. I think it's just marvelous. And I, I think it's just beautiful that finally uh, our country is uh, recognizing our own indigenous uh, art form. I think it's about time, B. <laughs> I agree. Clark Terry. And Clark is one of the people who was on the uh, Ellington tribute that we played a moment ago on this uh, particular program. And Clark certainly is the kind of person that represents a very special aspect of jazz. He's a unique performer on trumpet and a unique singer, and he epitomizes all of the things that we're going to be demonstrating. He and others will be demonstrating very shortly from the stage on the southern, uh, I guess it's the south lawn of the White House. Yeah.
And I think it is. I'm, I'm not familiar with the it's really place, beautiful. but it's so fantastically beautiful. It's just unbelievable. It's just gorgeous. Beautiful. Well, thank you very much, Clark Terry. Thank you, Doctor. My pleasure. The Newport Jazz Festival has developed in many directions over the 25 years that producer George Ween has shaped it. Ween, who also put together this White House Jazz Festival, saluting Newport, is with us today on the White House lawn. George, would you just review a little of how Newport got started, the Jazz Festival? Back in 1954, it was Louis and Elaine Laurelard came to me in my club in Boston at Storyville, and they uh, said that uh, they wanted to do something in Newport with jazz, and did I have any ideas? And I'd been recommended to them by a professor, a friend of mine at Boston University, Donald Bourne, and uh, I came up with the idea of the festival, and that's exactly how it started. Well, you've taken the festival all over the world. Has it changed very much in format as you've varied it? Oh, it's changed much in format, but never in spirit. We've, we've uh, tried to keep the same concept, uh, the responsibility of presenting the world of jazz as it is at any given time. And uh, we don't have a particular point of view with the festival. We try, uh, put it this way, the avant-gardists feel we don't present enough avant-gardists, the traditionalists feel we don't present enough traditional music, So, but we present some of all. And that's been the basic uh, perspective of the festival all these years. Well, we were talking just backstage a moment ago, and uh, we both noticed how cutting across all age and ethnic and uh, geographical barriers, the musicians themselves, as you were explaining the program, were very enthusiastic, and it wasn't a big problem with a guy from one generation playing with another. Well, that's, that's because there's a certain uh, uh, relationship with jazz that only jazz musicians understand. And that's, that's the difference between jazz and other music. You can't identify a jazz musician because you either are a jazz musician or you're not a jazz musician. Style, era, age have nothing to do with it. And that's why jazz is a great music. You're not a commercial musician, you're not a professional music, you're a jazz musician. The fact that that involves commercialism and professionalism, that's only in addition to the fact that you're a jazz player. Well now, in this context, some of the musicians who are playing here will be playing in uh, New York and Saratoga and will be doing some of the things. What are uh, uh, some of the similarities between what will go on here and what will go on in, in uh, the upcoming festival? Well naturally, the, the uh, fact that we have so many musicians in such a short time uh, limits the ability of the musicians to stretch out and get more of their personal message across. But the fact of, of putting musicians in different combinations and creating things that happen only at the festival, that same spirit is, is similar. That will happen at Saratoga, it'll happen at the concert at Carnegie Hall. And that's what differentiates the Newport Festival from just normal concerts. Well, I've kidded you a lot about, uh, because you're a pianist, uh, just organizing the festival so you could play the piano with all the good groups. What about that? You know, I find that, that, that uh, uh, I've played less and less in recent years, and I really think I'm playing better and better piano, personally, but I play less and less because maybe as I play better and better personally, I find out how badly I played originally. <laughs> 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 well, George, thank you very much. And um, you are producing better and better, and this, this kind of festival, I think, is one which not only will be a historic uh, tribute to jazz, but certainly to the festival, and thank you very much. Newport Jazz Festival producer George Ween. By the way, National Public Radio's Jazz Alive will be featuring live and recorded performance of the 1978 Newport Jazz Festival. Be sure to listen in on June 30th for a live performance of Chick Corea and Friends with pianist Herbie Hancock and Gary Burton and Woody Herman and the Thundering Herd. It's going to be a ball. As we mentioned earlier in the program, while the performers and guests are enjoying a jambalaya barbecue on the South Lawn, there's a great deal, um, well, there's a great New Orleans jazz band producing that good music that you were just listening to. The Young Tuxedo Brass Band from New Orleans, and they've been just enthralling the audience. The band has been around since the early 20s, and according to its leader, Herman Sherman, Louis Armstrong once played with the band and played a funeral with them a New Orleans tradition for traditional jazz bands, as you know. The leadership of the band has changed uh, a number of times over the years. Sherman, the present leader, told us that the band performs in the New Orleans area quite a bit now and occasionally uh, will revert to its traditional roots by performing at a funeral. I'm Billy Taylor. This is a special Jazz Alive performance 
a salute to the Newport Jazz Festival. 25 years old this summer. We have 40 of the greatest giants of jazz, and they're all with us today, along with some 600 other guests. We can expect to hear performances from artists like U.B. Blake, Cecil Taylor, Sonny Rollins, Max Roach, George Benson, Mary Lou Williams, and many, many others. One of those artists is with me right now, and he's a marvelous pianist, a guy whose career I followed with very pointed interest since I played the same instrument. <laughs> but he's, he's not only a friend, but a, a giant, one of the giants I was speaking of, McCoy Tyner. McCoy, how are you? Pretty good. How are you, Billy? Very well. What are you doing these days? I know you're playing uh, some very creative things. Where are you doing that? Well, I'm traveling all over, actually, uh, in the States, and uh, I think we got a European tour coming up, and uh, I'm supposed to touch on North Africa just for a minute, so uh, just traveling glo the globe and uh, trying to take some rest in between, you know. How do you find that people uh, around the world have received you in, in your recent tour? I know this is the first national recognition of jazz since the Duke Ellington Jazz Party. We don't get enough of that here. This is significant. But how do you find it in other parts of the world? I, I, I find the reception to be very good. Uh, I think the people seem to be uh, very attentive, and, uh, and I think that's about one of the best things you can ask for is uh, uh, an attentive audience, you know. And they seem to, <clears throat> not only historically, they seem to follow the music, have followed it, and they know your, uh, all of your records you've done. And um, uh, I, the enthusiasm seems to be uh, great, I think, abroad. Yeah. Well, tell me this. In terms of, uh, uh, they interact a lot in Japan and in Europe. Uh, is there a different kind of interaction when you're playing? Do you feel something uh, similar or something different from European audiences and American audiences? Well, I think we have a select group here in the States that uh, really appreciate the music because it's part of their lifestyle, it's part of their upbringing and, you know, the whole social thing. But they're sort of select. So they're closer? Yeah, they're closer. But I think that in, in Europe, um, you know, you, you get that overall enthusiasm, which I think is very important, uh, you know, in, in terms of masses. You know, I, I think the jazz audience is larger, much larger uh, uh, jazz uh, enthusiasts, let's, let's put it like that much larger in those countries, you know, and they sort of accept it. They put it on a high level, artistically. Higher uh, artistically, they compare it with uh, opera and other things? Yes, they do. I think they do. I think they compare it with opera, and uh, uh, they put it, they definitely give you the respect that uh, that's uh, just uh, deserving, you know. Well, thank you very much, McCoy Tyner, and you get that respect because you demand it with your very energetic and imaginative performances as a composer and as a player. So thank you very much. Thank you, Billy. Right now, we're sitting here talking with another of my favorite pianists. As a matter of fact, this gentleman had a big influence on my playing when I was trying to develop a piano style, and likewise, uh, many other uh, pianists. His name is Teddy Wilson. Teddy, how are you? Fine, Billy. How are you? Very well, thank you. It's quite an occasion a... here this, today at the White House, isn't it? It certainly is. The last time we were here, we were both listening to another pianist. Right. Mm -hmm. That was the occasion of uh, Vladimir Horace's uh, 50th anniversary uh, White House performance, wasn't That's it? That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you feel about this? I mean, you have uh, played with Benny Goodman, and you've done uh, things all over the world with your own groups. How do you mm -hmm. feel about this occasion? Well, this is one of those special things. I say, like the maybe the Goodman Carnegie Hall concert in 1938, or the the first jazz tour of Russia, and, and of course, this uh, special occasion. But this is also to commemorate the uh, 25th anniversary of Newport Jazz Festival, I think. Right. Too, right. Yeah. And uh, the kind of uh, um, input that you've had in terms of your contribution to jazz, I think, is very special because as one of the innovators, you've set the style, and you, as Milt Hinton and many of the other musicians who are here, I think are fitting choices. Uh, what are, are you doing at the present? Well, at the present, Billy, I'm at the Copley Plaza Hotel in Boston, to be precise. But in general, I'm just touring around the world, playing uh, sometimes solo and sometimes with trios and quintets and so on. Various, uh, not a steady group, but uh, musicians in each country or each city. I think it's very exciting because uh, when you travel, for instance, to Russia and you've been to other places, how have you found the audience different? Uh, I asked McCoy this and several other musicians, but how have you found the audiences different or, or similar? Well, not, not too different, uh, in, uh, Bill, in any, in any country, it, provided the presentation is exactly the same. In the festival situation, it's the same. Because the jazz club uh, is hard to find the parallel abroad there because the, the American jazz clubs are very expensive and the ones abroad are not. And a lot of young people don't, don't come to the ones here in America that cost so much. But in exactly the same presentation, I think the uh, 
the reaction of American audience is pretty much like those in uh, foreign countries. But I have noticed, say in Germany, northern Germany, a little cooler reaction, more warm reaction in southern Germany, and maybe the most enthusiastic to sort of generalize would have been in Dublin, Ireland, I would say. Oh, that's terrific. Mm -hmm. But I, I was interested in what you said about the uh, young audiences. Uh, because it uh, is not as expensive, you right. do get young audiences in places outside of the States. Yeah, in, in, uh, in Europe, in the jazz clubs, young people can afford that, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, that's terrific because maybe that's a lesson for us. And uh, if we lowered the prices, so many of the clubs wouldn't go out of business. <laughs> that's right. But not of the jazz clubs and you don't run one attraction a long time. They might have three or four different attractions a week. And uh, if the jazz club becomes like a little concert hall where they pay a moderate admission and then they can buy a beer or a drink when they're in there. Well, Te Teddy Wilson, thank you very much. And now the President of the United States, Jimmy Carter. Good to have you back. Thank you. If you give me attention just a moment, I'd like to say that you're welcome to the first White House Jazz Festival. I hope we have some more right. in the future. This is an honor for me to walk through this crowd and to meet famous jazz musicians and the families of those who are no longer with us, but whose work and whose spirit, whose beautiful music will live forever in our country. If there ever was an indigenous art form, one that is special, and peculiar to the United States and represents what we are as a country, I would say that it's jazz. Starting, starting late in the last century, there was a unique combination of two characteristics that have made America what it is. Individuality and a free expression of one's inner spirit in an almost unconstrained way, vivid, alive, aggressive, innovative, on the one hand, and the severest form of self-discipline on the other, never compromising quality as the human spirit burst forward in an expression of song. At first, this jazz form was not well accepted in respectable circles. I think there was an element of racism, perhaps, at the beginning, because most of the famous early performers were black, and particularly in the South, to have black and white musicians playing together was not a normal thing. And I believe that this particular form of music, of art, has done as much as anything to break down those barriers and to let us live and work and play and make beautiful music together. And the other thing that kind of separated jazz museums, musicians from uh, the upper levels of society was the reputation that jazz musicians had. Some people, thought, some people thought they stayed up late at night, drank a lot, and did a lot of carousing around. And uh, it took a few years for society to come together. I don't know, I'm not going to say as president whether the jazz musicians became better behaved or the rest of society caught up with them in drinking, carousing around and staying up late at night. But the fact is that over a period of years, the quality of jazz could not be constrained. It could not be unrecognized. And it swept not only our country, but is perhaps a favorite export product of the United States and Europe and in other parts of the world. I began listening to jazz when I was quite young. On the radio, listening to performances broadcast from New Orleans. And later when I was a young officer in the Navy in the early 40s, I would go to Greenwich Village to listen to the jazz performers that came there. And with my wife later on, we'd go down to New Orleans and listen to individual performances and on Sunday afternoons on Royal Street, sitting on the jam sessions that lasted for hours and hours. 
And then later, of course, began to learn the individual performers through phonograph records and also on the radio itself. This has had a very beneficial effect on my life. And I'm very grateful for what all these remarkable performers have done. 25 years ago, the first Newport Jazz Festival was held. So this is a celebration of an anniversary and a recognition of what it meant to bring together such a wide diversity of performers and different elements of jazz in its broader definition that collectively is even a much more profound accomplishment than the superb musicians and the individual types of jazz standing alone. And it's with a great deal of pleasure that I, as President of the United States, welcome tonight superb representatives of this music form. Having, having performers here who represent the history of music throughout this century, some quite old in years, still young at heart, others newcomers to jazz who've brought an increasing dynamism to it and are constantly evolving, stri striving for perfection as the new elements of jazz are explored. George Ween has put together this program and I'd like to welcome him now and thank him and all the superb performers whom I met individually earlier today and I know that we are all in, have in store for us a wonderful treat as a, some of the best musicians in our country, in the world, show us what it means to be an American and to join in the pride that we feel for those who have made jazz such a wonderful part of our lives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President and Madam Carter. It's nice to be uh, acknowledged for 25 years, but it's incidental to the situation here tonight because what's here tonight is one of the great experiences that I think any, any of you will ever be involved with. And particularly when I spoke to all the musicians this afternoon, to encounter the pride and the feeling that they have in being here tonight made the entire experience for me because it was just a joy to see how they want to be here, how they're looking forward to working in this thing. And I know, Mr. President, they all thank you for having the opportunity to come here. I thank you, the musicians thank you. And to get personal for just one second, of all the people I think it thanks you the most, it's my father, Dr. Ween, who has the best Father's Day present he ever had in his 85th year. So, <laughs> But he's a youngster compared to this next giant who's going to open the program. He's a man that goes back. Well, I said, you be, are you 96 yet? He says, don't push me. Don't push me. I won't be 96 till February. And ladies and gentlemen, he's an inspiration to all of us, the wonderful, the great U.B. Blake. The first number I'm going to play is Boogie Woogie Begin. Begin. There all is right. a boogie beat in it. No, the Cecil named it, so I'll play it. Boogie Woogie Begin. And if they let me play the next, I'm playing all my ASCAP numbers, you see. <laughs> my wife gave me something else, but when I play that, I don't get paid for it, see. That will be uh, memories of you after that. I think they'll let me play two numbers. So.
no less than Blackbirds with Andy Rizal. I think one of the great lyricists of his time. Not taking anything from my partner, Noble Sissel, I will now play, what did I say I was gonna play? <laughs> Memories of you. Boy, when you get up here, everything, forget everything, don't you? Look out. <laughs> We'll pause five seconds for station identification. This is NPR National Public Radio. Tonight, we have a surprise for you. Accompanied by Dick Hyman on the piano, mm -hmm. Doc Cheatham on the trumpet, and Milt Hinton on the bass, we want to present Mrs. Catherine Handy Lewis, who's going to sing St. Louis Blues, and she's the daughter of W.C. Handy. And let's welcome her here, ladies and gentlemen.
would have gone nowhere. Catherine Handy Lewis. Catherine, Miss Lewis, take a bow. And Adolphus Doc Cheatham on the trumpet, ladies and gentlemen. If you think he's a kid, forget it. He's 
He's been drawing Social Security how many years now? Ten years he's been drawing it. <laughs> Dick Hyman on the piano, ladies and gentlemen. Wonderful job. Wonderful. And Milt Hinton will be back in just a few moments. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have uh, several things happening. Today. It's sort of a capsule festival because the artists we have tonight could fill three nights of a normal jazz festival at Newport. But uh, we have to move right along. And what we're going to do is ask some of the musicians who aren't playing tonight to introduce those that are. We're going to ask this next gentleman who sort of uh, personifies elegance in jazz. As in, uh, and that is, uh, is that emphasized by the fact that he's just recently been point appointed to the board of directors of the Rockefeller Foundation. Now, that's a long way for a jazz musician to come. And let's welcome him here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, Billy Taylor. Thank you. I'm very proud to be here, and one of the things that we're doing, of course, is carrying this whole evening on National Public Radio, and so we're having a ball over in the corner just listening to Yubi and all of the great artists who are going to play for you. I'd like to just say that this represents something that many of us have been working very hard for for a long time, and that is recognition for jazz in the country in which it was originated. It's very important, we think. The idea of having the President of the United States say the marvelous things that he said a moment ago and really show the kind of uh, spirit that many uh, Americans may feel but don't often express is very helpful to us. And I think the person that I'm going to int uh, introduce epitomizes much of what the president was talking about and what uh, the music is about. This artist is one who just uh, this past year was artist in residence at Duke University. Now this is a unique area for an artist to perform in. She has great experience as a composer, arranger, not only a fine pianist, but she has worked with children. And her kind of inspiration, not only as a fine performer and the kind of uh, inspiration to many of our leaders like Thelonious Monk and a few others, uh, the kinds of things that she's done personally are epitomized in her playing. And I'd like to present at this point Ms. Mary Lou Williams. Mr. President, Mrs. Carter, jazz lovers, what I'd like to do is to play the history of jazz. Spiritual Ragtime, Kansas City, Kansas City Swing, and the Bop Air, and the blues, I'd like to play. That's your healing in the jazz music.
ladies and gentlemen. Mary Lou Williams. There's a lot of musical knowledge involved in what that lady just did. In the history of the baritone sax, there have been two definitive voices. One is the late, great Harry Carney, who played with the Duke Ellington Orchestra for so many years. The other is Jerry Mulligan. And he's here to introduce the next group of musicians. Ladies, let's welcome... Jerry Mulligan up here.
Thank you, George. I may ought to be playing, but I'm announcing a lineup here that after I announce them and bring them on, you'll never miss me. For instance, we have Teddy Wilson on piano. Joe Jones on drums. Theodore. Right. And Joe. Milt Hinton on bass. <laughs> then we get to, we used to call him Little Jazz, but I think we call him Big Jazz, Roy Eldridge. <laughs> <laughs> And Clark Terry. <laughs> Mr. Tenor Saxophone, Illinois Jacket. And, hello. And on alto saxophone and he also plays trumpet and piano and as a composer and arranger. He's not going to do any of those things. He's going to play alto. Benny Carter. WANU-FM, Washington, D.C. Thank you very much, Jerry. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We'd like to start in with a number which we think should certainly be included in any jazz, comp uh, any jazz contribution or tribute, certainly something to the great man himself, Mr. Duke Ellington. We're going to start off with in a mellow tone.
We'd like to play now a grand old favorite, Lady Be Good. Thank you. 
Hey, we're cooking. Yes. Yeah. Joe Jones. Jack at Illinois Jack Kent. Clark Terry. Little Jazz hit that high one at the end like a young Jazz. <laughs> Bill Hinton. Teddy Wilson, wherever he is. Benny Carter. Wow. Of the avant-garde and uh, experimental things that are happening. And one of the leaders in that movement down there is a guy, he's not such a young guy himself. He's older than I am, but he doesn't look it. But he's, he's, uh, he's incredibly well known in Europe. In a sense, he's better known in Europe than he is in America. And that's a shame because he should be better known here. We asked him to come along tonight. And he's going to introduce the next group. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Sam Rivers. Thank you very much. It was great pleasure and deep respect that I uh, introduced the next four musicians to you. I've known them for a great many years and I've listened to their music and uh, I really enjoy it and I, I know that they are among the greatest musicians that have uh, ever been in the history of the music. Sonny Rollins, tenor <laughs> saxophone. Uh, yeah, so. McCoy Tyner, the piano. Max Roach, drummer. Max Roach. Working? Max Roach. And Ron Carter on bass. Ron Carter. You want to come up? There's an announcement here for a minute, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. or Mrs. Brent Chambers, go to the South Portico doorway, please. We're holding an emergency phone call for Mr. or Mrs. Brent Chambers.
This is shit. It's just, is this mic on now? Is this one on? Okay. We never know what mics are on. Uh, there's one more thing I want to do here. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to ask you now to acknowledge a man in the audience. He's one of the greatest musicians of our generation. He's a man whose courage and strength is only exceeded by his talent and creativity. He's sitting over here, ladies and gentlemen. I want you to stand up for this one, because I want you to give as great a round of applause as you've ever had in his life for Charlie Mingus. Come on, Mingus, stand up, will you? God bless you, Charlie Mingus. We're just going to take a short break, about two or three minutes, while we change the cymbals and the drums and get ready for the next part of the program. It's not an intermission, so don't go anywhere. What am I doing? The president has been just taking pictures with Charles Mingus, and we have... Uh, been listening to something very special. The president's been sitting on the ground in a short sleeve shirt and just enjoying the sounds of UB Blake, Catherine Handy Lewis, and Mary Lou Williams. And Mary Lou played a capsule history of jazz piano and she really got into all kinds of things there. Teddy Wilson, Milt Hinton, Joe Jones, Illinois Jaquet, uh, Benny Carter, Clark Terry, and Roy Eldridge followed with a really marvelous mainstream uh, approach. And when the rhythm section is together, the whole session is together, I tell you. It was really very exciting. And sitting next to me is a gentleman who is a very special friend of mine who uh, is not only uh, one of the most innovative drummers in jazz, he's uh, uh, just finished, you just finished listening to him, McCoy Tyner, Ron Carter, and Sonny Rollins were playing, and Max Roach was the percussionist, the multiple percussionist who was doing all of those marvelous things a moment ago. And Many of the, uh, the exciting things that are going to be happening uh, will include musicians like Max, but let's just say a word to this tremendous artist. Max, we really enjoyed what you just did. Well, listen, you know, you said a, a very profound thing just earlier. You said when the rhythm section is together, everything is together. I'm afraid we were together on that last one, and it had all to do with me. I think I over... Sometimes, you know, Billy... You can become so excited because so many wonderful people are around you, like you and and uh, folks like Sonny Rollins and them until, you know, as long as I've been in this business, I was really nervous up there. No kidding. Yes, sir. It was, now, when you play like that and you're nervous, I really like to hear you when you, when you really settle down. <laughs> well, that was very exciting. Max. Thanks sounded, so much. From brother. here, it sounded great. You know, one thing I'd like to just say on a very serious note is that I just hope that this event here in this hollowed place the White House, the home of the President of the United States, has some bearing on the future, not only of this great culture that, I, that you certainly have given and dedicated yourself to, Billy, but I like to think of myself in the same light. Uh, but it, it, it awakens those forces like the National Endowment on the Arts and other benevolent groups who are disposed to our well-being to give us the kind of assistance that will help us to really not only preserve but perpetuate and go forward so that we can ply out of all these wonderful people who are of different dispersions racially, religiously and everything else, the kind of definitive culture that I think that this country can, uh, that this country should and, and should produce. And, and just one more thing, you know, I've often thought to myself and I tell many of my students that, you know, jazz reflects democracy. It's what this country is supposed to be about and is about because we take, we take a theme and everybody has an equal voice into producing a solid piece of music providing they adhere to, of course, the laws governing the melodic and harmonic and rhythmic uh, 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 rules of that particular piece. 
as as opposed to you know, and I you know I hate to use comparisons, but as as opposed to say classical music, where there where it's, to me it's imperialistic in its nature because there are only two factions involved. That's the composer and the conductor, and you may have a thousand men out there, or women, and then no more than slaves. So you know, I wonder why all over the world that we travel, where the music is really extremely popular, you find. It, it has freed the musician, and I think it's, it's America's gift to the, to the musical world and especially to the musician. I, listen, I could go on for days, so I'm going to get off of here. <laughs> Thanks, Billy. Really, Max, so much. you're as eloquent as usual, and I really appreciate your taking time after playing such a hard set. And even though short, <laughs> that was a hard one. I know what you're talking about. So thank you very much. This is NPR National Public Radio. So, my ladies and gentlemen, his next work with Giants, let me tell you, on the piano, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome him up here, Herbie Hancock. On the drums, on the drums, Tony Williams, ladies and gentlemen. On bass, once again, Ron Carter. On the guitar, fresh from the hip record, George Benson, ladies and gentlemen. On the tennis saxophone, Dexter Gordon. And on the trumpet, he's been here before, Dizzy Gillespie. George Ween has just introduced Herbie Hancock, George Benson, Tony Williams, Dizzy Gillespie, Ron Carter, Dexter Gordon, and they're about to play a set. And while they're tuning up, everyone is kind of excited now because they're standing around listening to several of the major forces in jazz from different perspectives, doing something that every musician has to do, which is tune up. <laughs> if they're going to sound like this.
Benson, Dizzy Gillespie. Time is is unbelievable. I want uh, I want to introduce this next gentleman. He's one of my very closest friends. He's the artistic director of the Monterey Festival, and I want to welcome him here tonight. The founder of the Modern Jazz Quartet, one of the finest guys I know, ladies and gentlemen, John Lewis. Thank you, George. Thank you very much. Uh, thinking back now, uh, 25 years ago, I remember playing at uh, the first uh, Newport Jazz Festival in Newport, and uh, at the time, I never would have guessed that we would have the opportunity of playing here on this lawn. The lawn we played on in Newport was the, uh, I think, the, the tennis courts of the Newport Tennis Club. 
so this is quite a, a jump. I would like to, after this marvelous parade of jazz that you've had up until this time, to introduce to me one of the most exciting musicians to come along in the 50 years that I've been enjoying and participating in jazz. I'd like to introduce he. He made a tremendous impact on me and still does. Uh, Mr. Ornette Coleman and his son, Donardo Coleman. I'd like to play um, two uh, compositions uh, back to back. Uh, the first one will be called Earth Souls and the second one is Meta.
Ornette Coleman, ladies and gentlemen. And that's contemporary jazz at its very, very finest. This next artist is equally as influential in the contemporary music scene as Ornette. And he played at the Newport Jazz Festival many, many, many years ago. And it's really wonderful to have him here. Is he over there, ladies and gentlemen? Let's welcome Cecil Taylor. Thank you. 
Ladies and gentlemen. Wow. Listen to that applause, huh? You know, ladies and gentlemen, there are, there are many, many people here tonight that we'd like to acknowledge who've really made it possible for the Newport Jazz Festival to survive for 25 years through many problems and many moves and many different gyrations. We really can't acknowledge everybody here than the contributions they've made to jazz and and what they've done over the years i would just like to say hello to elaine larlard who was with us at the very beginning back in 1954 ladies and gentlemen and uh, elaine i haven't seen you but i want to wish you luck it's nice to have you here this is the last set ladies and gentlemen we have to get out of here at 8 30 the president said we're going to go a few minutes over but we'll be very close and I don't say we saved the best for the last because everything has been the best tonight. But uh, we're going to introduce this next group one at a time, ladies and gentlemen. On the piano, one of the brilliant figures in American music today. Let's welcome Chick Corea, ladies and gentlemen. Here you go, Chick. We just finished a world tour. And how I had the energy to fly across the country again, I don't know, but thank you, Chick. On the drums, Luigi Bellasoni, Lu Louis Belson, ladies and gentlemen. He flew in from Texas. Okay. On the bass, maybe the best of all time, I don't know. If you ask him, he might tell you yes. And uh, he is the great Ray Brown, ladies and gentlemen. Ray flew in from California. On one tenor saxophone, one of the greatest instrumentalists America's ever produced, ladies and gentlemen, Stan Getz. On another tenor saxophone, maybe it's his alter ego, I don't know, but he's his friend for many years, ladies and gentlemen, Zoot Sims. Bringing him back on guitar to help out. I think he's there. George Benson again, ladies and gentlemen. And on, well, they used to introduce him this way. You, let's see. The, the, how do they say it? I'm trying to remember how it goes. The uh, wizard of the piano, the master of the drums, and the king of the vibraharp, ladies and gentlemen. He's one of the great figures that America's ever produced in any way, Lionel Hampton.
why he's gone to the front to be in one of the all-time great jazz musicians, composers, and he's a really a, a swell fellow too. I'm talking about Chickaria, huh? Yeah, yeah. Chick is at the piano. I know the rest of the guys have been introduced, but here's a guy going to play something special for you on a tenor saxophone that only he can play. And I'm talking about my good friend Stan Getz playing Lushlauf. Lushlauf. <laughs> Thank you. 
And it's hard to believe because, as you can well see, this is just as much a part of the greatness of our nation as the White House itself or the Capitol building down the way. Stan Getz and Ronald Hampton and the other ones have been heroes of mine for a long time. And I'd like to point out to all of you that these musicians have come here, some from overseas, as far away as California in our own country, at their own expense to present to you tonight this concert from their hearts. And uh, anybody who wants to is free to go, but I'm going to stay and listen to some more music if we can get some. <laughs> Just for that, Mr. President, we're going to play the Jimmy Carter Jazz Rag. <laughs> NPR will continue its coverage as long as the festival goes on. The president said he's going to stay and listen, and we're going to listen with him.
and a Pearl Bailey. You know, I got a confession to make. Pearl came up here and wanted to sing with us, and I thought she was any other lady. Uh, uh, and so uh, I, I had my pocket. <laughs> Pearl Bailey looked white to me. <laughs> I'll tell you how I got up here. Attorney Bell said, go ahead up and help him. <laughs> uh, I, what you're going to do for me is what I'm going to do for this house in a minute. Let's go with the good old summertime. It's hot. Give you a rhythm, Give you a rhythm I was born with. I can't give that away. <laughs> Want them? Let's swing. One, two, I up, 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 in the good old summertime. In the good old summertime. Find me, honey. Strolling down that shady lane, right north, with that baby.
have to have a horn to swing, honey. You can swing without the horn. Oh, yes, sir. With my baby mine. Let me tell you, I'm going to take his hand. He'll take mine. I said, Lord, 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 won't that be mine? We'd like to play, but it gets dark out here, and there are no lights on the lawn, and we don't want anybody to trip going out. So we should really call it. I want to thank the Jambalaya Association of Gonzales for bringing all that jambalaya. And I want to thank the Tuxedo Brass Band. Oh, just a moment. Mrs. Carter's here, and... It's Mrs. Carter has asked for Pearl Bailey to sing another song. What do you think? You think we should let her? <laughs> Can we get a piano player, bass player, and a drummer? A drummer especially. He better come here. <laughs> now, you know, we were really moving because the president said he was going in the house, and here he is back on the lawn. Well, I tell you, let's let's do. Thank you, William. And we need Louis out here. What? Uh, I, your wife couldn't didn't tell me her favorite song. What's yours, sir? I tell you one. You can't miss with. You can't miss with the St. Louis Blues, can you? All right. Where, where's my group? Come on here. But well, help you let let Louis get on there for me, cause I'm used to him. You get over on your. Come on over here. Now, now, Hamp, you got to give me a chance to sing this time. Come on, come on, because Louis is used to my language. We're going to do a little St. Louis blues. The president came all the way back out of the house. I'm not in a hurry. Huh? Me either, sir. I'll stay here all night. Yes, sir. And thank you, Mrs. Carter, for getting me the gig for the day. I just worked with this guy in Dallas last night. And this one I've been knowing for years. No, way up there so we can have a little jam. Bring it up. I hate to see the evening sun go down. I hate to see the evening sun go down. Cause that man of mine, he done left this town. I'm feeling tomorrow like I feel today. Lord, if I'm feeling tomorrow like I feel today, I'm gonna pack my trunk and make my getaway. Did you know I was a St. Louis woman? I got diamond rings, got my heart around that apron string. If it wasn't for powder, all oh, that store about where that man of mine wouldn't go nowhere. No, well, Lord, I got St. Louis blues, blue as I can be. My I love that man, black schoolboy boy loves his pie. Just like an old Kentucky colonel loves that rock and ride. I love that man till the day. What did I just say to you? I had to say Louis Blues. I got to say Louis Blues. Yes, I'm just as blue as I can be. Yeah! 
special surprise guest by the name of Pearl Bailey. On stage here at the White House Jazz Festival, accompanied on piano by NPR's own Billy Taylor, which is why uh, you're hearing me, Steve Rath, while Billy uh, comes back down from the stage, and Lionel Hampton on vibes, Milt Hinton on bass, and Louis Belson on the drums. Billy's making his way back now from the stage, and uh, we'll bring you up to date as we continue and conclude NPR's coverage of this first White House Jazz Festival. Billy, nice yeah. job, fella. Thank you. Thank you. That was a ball <laughs> and a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> what a pleasure to get to hear you play tonight. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure to get to play after all of that. There are a lot of things that have been happening, and as you know, as you've been listening, part two of the festival really came alive with Herbie Hancock, George Benson, Tony Williams, Dizzy Gillespie, Ron Carter, Dexter Gordon, and Ornette Coleman and his son played something really beautiful. The Cecil Taylor uh, solo seemed to really capture the president's imagination. He came back after the uh, solo and uh, said a few words to Cecil to tell him how much he enjoyed it, uh, especially. Lionel Hampton, Chick Corea, Louis Belson, Ray Brown, Stan Getz, uh, Zoot Sims, Roy, um, Benny Carter, and George Benson. It was a ball. A lot of folks were doing a lot of good things. And of course, and we're about to have some more things happen. Excuse me, Billy. It looks like the president's back up on stage, and Max Roach is there with him. And we can get this cloud, crowd cleared from way in front of us. We can see what's going on. And before we go into it, I'd like to tell you, as well as you, Mr. Carter, that you know this instrument here that we call the jazz drum is the only indigenous American instrument on this stage tonight. You know, and um, it's quite an industry in this country, and I love playing it. But anyway, this is a piece that just utilizes the trumpet and the foot cymbal. And the hand. Right on. Very good. And the hand. How are you doing?
Max Roach. Yeah. Gotta give a flower for Bobby. Dizzy Gillespie and uh -oh. Max Roach, who was just playing the cymbal, only the cymbal just then, nothing else, the hi-hat cymbal, was uh, now, now. asked by the president to continue to play something else. That was really exciting. Now, just trumpet now, and, now and cymbal. The president, Which one? His, his highness, <laughs> has asked us to play a tune that we played at the White House where we were here before. All right. We're going to play this tune in which the name of it is Salt Peanuts. Right. Oh. Now, wait a minute. That. But there are some diplomatic strings attached. <laughs> to wit, that the president himself, his Majesty. Right on. <laughs> Sing the lyrics to Salt Peanuts. Yeah. All right, all right. All right. All right. Salt peanuts, salt peanuts. 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 <laughs> wait, 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 I just want to, I just want to ask one question. I just got one question. Would you like to go on the road with us? <laughs> I might have to after the night. <laughs> The President of the United States just jumped. We love you, Dizzy! Yeah. Right on, right on. The President of the United States. <laughs> Dizzy Gillespie, Max Roach, and Jimmy Carter, a very fine trio, doing Salt Peanuts. Salt Peanuts. The vocal, of course, by, was by the President. Here he is again. Everybody, everybody says that there's no way to um, to exceed that finale, so this is the end of the program for tonight. Wow. Wow. Thank you very much. It's Thank been you. wonderful. And I, George. Our broadcast was produced and directed by Steve Raff, associate producers Greg Fitzgerald and Tim Owens, assistant director Paulette Pecker. Our 
technical director has been Chuck Thompson, assisted by Skip Peasy, with John Beale and Roger Bird. In master control, John Whetstone, our production assistant, Carol McBothwick. We'd be remiss if we didn't add some thank yous to George Ween and the staff of the Newport Jazz Festival, to Ann Anderson and the White House staff, and to Michael Cascuna, Ben Lacey, Richard Spring, and Al Friedman. Portions of this program were pre-recorded. Production funds for this program were provided by the National Endowment for the Arts and the, Corpor and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. If you'd like to receive more information about National Public Radio's Jazz Alive broadcasts, you can write to Jazz Alive, National Public Radio, Washington, D.C., 20036. Hey, I've had a ball. I'm Billy Taylor, and it's been really special being here at the White House, and we hope you've enjoyed the White House Jazz Festival as much as we've enjoyed bringing it to you. This is NPR National Public Radio. This is Mike Nitka, Program Director of WAMU-FM, with the latest NEH update. Thanks to so many of our supporters who have already made their donations toward our National Endowment for the Humanities Challenge grant. When June started, we needed $10,000 this month to receive our match from NEH.